Welcome to the last episode of our Blades in the Dark series. As usual, we have a few announcements before getting into the show. Just another reminder, if you want to play a couple games of Chimera with me in person this January, I will be at the Midwinter Gaming Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I still have plenty of slots open, so it'd be great to meet some of you in person. You can find all the links to the sign-up page as well as the convention page in the show notes. The One Shot Network is continuing their Patreon drive. As of this recording, or a couple minutes ago when I looked at it, they are $33 away from unlocking the next reward, which is part four of the Bin Bon and Jubna series, which I am dying to hear because I need to know what happens. Mm -hmm. So depending on what level you back at, you could get a shout out on One Shot or Campaign, you can get access to the Secret Archive, or even potentially a monthly game. Ooh. I know. Uh, money from the Patreon goes to support all of the shows on the network, including ours. Mm -hmm. So please consider giving if you can. Um, and you can find the Patreon at patreon.com slash one shot podcast. Yeah, excellent. And we also love hearing from all of you wonderful people out there. So come on, join us down at our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com or hit us up on Twitter. Another great way to tell us what you think of the podcast is to leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or on our Facebook page. We love hearing your thoughts on the show, but only if they're nice. And <laughs> don't tell us bad things. <laughs> um, but it's a great way to let others know what you think and help other people find the show. So we are going to read a review, as always. This one is from Jude, so I feel like it doesn't count since he's already been on the show like twice, but he said nice things anyway, so I'll read it. It is titled, Explores a Missing Space in the RPG Sphere. Character Creation Cast and Character Evolution Cast are diving into a part of the RPG world that is crucially underserved right now, helping players grow in their art. GMs have a ton of advice, but players need help and advice too, and Amelia and Ryan do a fantastic job of showcasing how to build unique, deep characters in a variety of systems, and then how to grow those characters on Character Evolution Cast. Yeah, thank you so much, Jude. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was very nice. Thanks for being nice to me for once, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> He's always been nice to me, so... Well, everybody's nice to you because you're nice to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <sighs> <laughs> well, with all of that said, let's get on with the show. Enjoy. discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Blades in the Dark. This episode we are discussing the character creation process. We're very excited to welcome back some of the cast of the Magpies podcast. Do you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us about the characters you made in our last episode? Uh, Minna, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm Minna. I'm in the Magpies podcast and the Iron Heights podcast, which is newly launched on the One Shot Network. Um, my character is, let me pull up the character sheet. I have a character named Madri. She, she's the uh, leech playbook, which means she's a saboteur and technician. Um, she came from Eruvia, um, was raised in a temple and as a healer, and has since uh, fallen into loyalty to the Severosi princess played by Josie. Josie, do you want to tell us about your character? Yeah, my character um, is named Alton Sarnai, um, or Ryder, as she's more commonly known. Um, she's an exiled princess of the Severosi uh, horse tribes, and she fled, essentially, a forceful coup, as is common out there, um, with her bodyguard into Duskwall. Um, and has fallen in with this cult to reestablish her power and take back her lineage. And Ree, how about yourself? 
Yeah, uh, so I'm Re. I'm the GM and producer of the Magpies podcast. Um, and the character that I built last time is Nazrin Azaria, the Lurk, which is kind of the like infiltrator uh, stealth person. Um, she uh, is also Aruvian in her heritage, um, was a student uh, at uh, Doskval Academy's College of Immortal Sciences, got disowned by her family, probably due to her habit of stealing uh, sensitive documents from, from nobility and blackmailing people with it, um, and has also fallen in with this cult, um, which she uh, sees as kind of a, a path to... Uh, reclaiming the the power and privilege that was so unfairly stripped from her. <laughs> Amelia, how about yourself? Uh, I created. Um, hold on, I gotta like find my notes, guys. I turned the page. <laughs> oh, I know. Okay, uh, I created Arden Swell. I used the Whisper playbook. Um, Arden is a from a family of high priests. In um, is it? Tykeros? Yes. Um, and worked as a vizier for the local... I don't know who's in power there. How does that even run in Tykeros? Nobody knows. Who we knows? have no idea. Okay. However okay. you want. You, right. get to, you get to make it up right now. All right. So a vizier to, let's say, the... I feel like emperor is a correct term. Well, actually, I guess it would be... So Tykeros is part of the empire, so it would be somebody... Yeah, technically. Dang. How did the empire? Maybe it. Is, maybe it's not. I don't know. Whatever. They can have an emperor out there too. That's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, emperor, sub emperor, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and is just really into trying out rituals and cult stuff, and like, uh, you know. Snorting ghosts and seeing what happens. <laughs> As you do. Right. And Ryan, what about you? Um, I created Kitsune Vale, also known as Vixen. Uh, she was a <laughs> princess from the Dagger Isles. Um, practiced as a socialite uh, in the noble houses over there. Um, and uh, found her way here because... Uh, she both wants to protect her best friend and sometimes kinky lover, <laughs> <laughs> Nerix, uh, from Amelia's character, because uh, I don't want Nerix to be snorted. <laughs> <laughs> so she also joined this cult because uh, she heard word that the physical manifestation of an actual god comes to this cult at times and she wants to get good enough to be able to manipulate this god herself wow yeah it's a pretty intense group of people <laughs> yeah it really is so we are going to go ahead and dive right into our segment that we call d20 for your thoughts d20 for your thoughts in this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process in the system and how it feels compared to other games that you've played. Um, but first, we want to ask each of you how you got into role playing. Who wants to start? <laughs> I, I guess I'll start. Um, I kind of had just a really sudden and unexpected introduction to role playing. It was like, gosh, I think in my senior year of high school, even. And just out of nowhere, uh, a shared friend of ours just came in and was like, hey, I want to do D DM this D&D &D thing for y'all. So I did. I made a sorcerer and I haven't stopped making sorcerers since. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, it was just sort of all of a sudden in my life one day. Hmm. And I took up GMing pretty quick. I haven't GMed in a couple of years, but I spent like almost a decade GMing mostly D&D &D before branching out into other stuff over the past few years like this. Okay. So what precipitated the branching out into other stuff? I was getting part of it was just awareness of like the wider world of world of role playing because yeah. like all I knew was D&D &D and like fancy heartbreakers and stuff like that for a long time. Um, but also just searching for like, more 
in-depth character stories, I guess, because Mm -hmm. it's just nothing about D&D excludes that, but... It's not built specifically to do that. It's not built specifically to do that, and people will tend away from it even if you ask for it. Mm -hmm. So it was more like, yeah, I like my mechanics and stuff, but I do want it to be thematic and tell stories and stuff like that. Very cool. So I started branching up the stuff that could do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, How about Minna? How how did you get into role-playing? So I actually played my first role-playing game in, like, February of 2017. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think even as far back as, like, 2011, 2012, I thought, hey, that sounds neat. That could be fun if I ever find... But I just never found people to, like, do it with. Um, So I actually ran across on, like, an Anon meme. Like, somebody had put out a thing like, oh, looking for new players to introduce to the game. I'm going to run a game specifically for that. Um, And then right around then, I also found the one-shot Discord. So before that short adventure was even over, I was, like, plunged face-deep into indie gaming. Like the more narrative driven games that one shot tends to favor Mm -hmm. uh which yes wonderful i have not looked back except for the time i checked out al at the local gaming store and didn't enjoy it very much (laughs) um so yeah um even that first D game we had one combat the entire three month adventure (laughs) it was very short (laughs) my kind of game yeah yeah no it was it was just a mystery in like some city oh that's amazing um Anyway, yes, uh, so I'm pretty new to role-playing, uh, relatively speaking. What about you, Ri? Um, So I first started with um, a, a D&D group. I believe it was D&D 3.0 uh, in high school um, when I was like 15. That first group did not go well. I've talked about it in depth um, on some other interview <laughs> shows, and it's not really the focus of this conversation, but it wasn't. Turns out that when you play a game with a bunch of teenage boys who are enrolled in an all-boys Catholic high school and you're the only girl, it ain't gonna go well. <laughs> yes. it's, yeah. it's a bad time. But even with kind of all of the weirdness and grossness and guy who stalked me for a couple of years um, <laughs> of that group, uh, I only played for like four or five sessions with them, but I was still like, even with all of that horribleness and just that very brief introduction, I was still like, this is good. This is cool. I can tell there's something here that I want. Um, and fortunately, I, w- I was lucky enough to then I found a a good a better group later on in high school and then a really good group in college. And then um, I didn't really branch out into other systems outside of D&D 3.5 which I still know inside and out. <laughs> it is it is a shame I will carry with me forever. Um, I didn't really start branching out until, uh, again, um, I, I came across uh, the One Shot Network and specifically Campaign Podcast, the, the Star Wars version. Um, uh, and then just kind of the narrative dice system and the kind of stories they were telling. And then I started listening to like the one shot episodes and it was just like, Oh my God, it it was, I feel like this is probably an analogy that James may have used at some point, but it's like, I had been eating Cheerios my entire life. And then someone took me to the cereal aisle and I was like, Oh my God, there's so much, there's so many (laughs) options. Um, And so, yeah, uh, basically I guess I think I started listening to campaign in 2015-ish, mm-hmm. um, and, like, I have, have been into role-play games since high school, but, like, since that point, it has just, like, consumed an ever-growing part of my life to the point where I'm doing a podcast about it <laughs> and yeah. playing in a ton of other games every week, so... Yeah, I feel like you and I have had a very similar experience of like, <laughs> oh, I played in high school and it was kind of icky. And then I I still had that craving to do it, though. Yeah. And then eventually, like, found another group. It was still kind of icky. Um, but, like, One Shot was the thing that made me want to go back to it. I was like, oh, it can be this whole other thing from yeah. this experience mm-hmm. that I had. Um, and then it wasn't. But then now it is. Yeah. Yeah, that was articulate. I do want to issue a correction, by the way. I said that I'm pretty new to role playing, which is a hundred percent not true because I've been role playing since I was about thirteen. 
Uh, I just used to do text role play. Ah. Oh, which yeah. Which is a much different. It's all narrative. Uh, also heavily female. You don't get a lot of people who aren't. Um, well, I guess that's changed over the. But like, still heavily that skewed that way. I think that uh, online anon- anonymity um, kind of tends to skew more female. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think and, by and, like, just like fiction virtue spaces of- and things like that. Like, um, but I did know. Before I started, pl- before I played that D and D game, I knew there were like other systems out there, and that D and D was not my ideal. That mm-hmm. was just the one of convenience for my first game. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, like, I guess I've just been looking for exactly this kind of thing. Like, I don't know. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's very cool. Um, well, then let's hop into. Uh, can you tell us about your personal process for picking and creating characters for any game? Uh, is there any specific things you, you kind of look out for or any uh, techniques that you use to figure out what you want to play as? Uh, I tend to... I don't usually start from a specific place, but usually I kind of have the process of informing the mechanics and character back and forth, like a dialogue. I've never like considered them completely separate, so I'll like find some aspect mechanically that i like and be like oh what characters can i build out of this um like i looked like i looked at the hound and and the idea of having a hunting pet uh inspired me a lot and then that then i thought about like well okay how do you use a hunting pet if i'm using it in this way what ethnicity makes the most sense and just sort of bouncing back and forth um (laughs) But sometimes I start from a role play aspect and then put the mechanical thing on there. Um, but I go back and forth. Like I hear some people describe it as starting from one and developing into the other. But I like to bounce back and forth at each stage. That makes sense. I I think mine is more. I will. I'll usually look through playbooks or classes and see which one appeals to me, and then I will go off. <laughs> And develop a whole person and backstory <laughs> and and things. And then I'll be like, okay, I have this person. How can I like retrofit this all into the mechanics? Mm-hmm. Um so I uh which that that's kind of evolved more recently. I used to do the opposite where I would just build the character out mechanically and then be like, okay, what kind of story makes sense for for this character? But yeah, now it's kind of like, okay what is the kind of person that I am going to want to play? And then I will, uh, you know, fill in the, the mechanics to match that. Um, I found that a lot more satisfying than necessarily building a, a story out of the mechanics, because then I know that the, the mechanics that I'm building are based on something that I want to play. Right. I think Ray and I have talked about this, but we have like fairly similar like approaches to like, uh, we'll start, I'll also start with like a playbook or class or something just to give me like a little bit of a direction and then I will go out and do too much with backstory. Uh, <laughs> Magpies is actually a really good example. And so like I, I knew I wanted a uh, spider, but it took me a while to come up with like who she was. And I had to like, I actually dug into the whole like little uh, guide to the city because a lot of my character creation and like especially games where I'm really interested in the setting is all like look at the setting and see what kind of person you can make who lives there if that makes sense mm-hmm. definitely so like I started looking at it and I'm like oh I love uh, Char Hollow with its like that's kind of like the industrial workers like little community that they live in and I guess just kind of like built up from like this is somebody who came from this area and then became a spider like a manipulator with like information and connections and yeah so I'll I do too much with backstory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that, that though. Like when you, especially when you play in games that have kind of a pretty established setting, it's really nice to be able to mm-hmm. go in there and say, "Where do I fit in this already built world?" Yeah. Like even with D anD D, when I did that little that short campaign that I was in my first game, I emailed. I sent the longest emails back and forth to the DM. Like, okay, I have this character concept where could she be from? And then this is this whole backstory I'm building up from the wiki. I think she was um, Cormirian and like a member of it. I made like a whole family tree for her. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, because like, 
um, her place in the family and like living up to the family's expectations was really important to her. So like, I thought it was fun to have that. <laughs> it doesn't always come up, but it can make for fun stuff. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're not gonna like shame anybody here for doing too much stuff with their characters. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So how do you feel like the character creation in this game stacks up against other games that you've played? It goes pretty quickly. Um, I think, I mean, for, for us, it took a little bit longer because we were like discussing each step of it. But if you're just sitting down by yourself to do a character, you can, if, if you're not really, if you're just doing it fast, like for, for when I've run this at conventions, you can whip up a character in 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Which, you know, differs from from some of the crunchier games where it's like, okay, d and I'm going to need to set aside a couple hours to flip through source books and find an equipment list. And mm -hmm. It seems like if you know the setting well, uh, that would make things go a lot faster with some of the, like, the background information. Yes. Yes. Um, for me coming into this with pretty much zero uh, knowledge of what the setting is all about, um, it, it took a little bit of listening to some of your descriptions and a little bit of reading uh, about the, the different places and the people there that uh, would have taken a little bit longer uh, had I been doing that on my own. Yeah. I think it does take a little, but like compared to things like, again, compared to D&D, &D, trying to come up with a backstory and situate your character in the setting, this is like made so easy. I cannot say enough how much I love the little city sections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and the thing with this game, too, is that the book itself is not very big. It's, yeah. You know, it's not a huge, like, it's not even, like, textbook sized. It's a little, I'm gonna, like, yeah, put it's my almost hands like... up and people can't see, but it's a small <laughs> book. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, there's really not a lot of things that you would have to flip through or right. run through. Like, there's only so much there. Mm -hmm. And I think they also, like, take pains to, like, give you what you need where you need it. So, mm -hmm. like, on the Choose a Heritage section, there's little blurbs about each of the places. And there's some other details other places. But you don't need those. You mm -hmm. can just use the, if you want this kind of character, this is the background you choose. And the playbooks do a really nice job of having all of the, most of the necessary information right mm -hmm. on there, too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go mm -hmm. and look things up. And, you yeah. know, you think of, like, a blank sheet that's, like, feats. O yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what you know it's all right there it's like pick one of these four things okay i can do that kind of like the pbta style of you just need the one sheet yeah yeah <laughs> i i do see a lot of the the powered by the apocalypse influence um in the character creation process here uh the only thing that i was missing out on was the uh like relationships uh with the other players yeah so. i that was one of the things i was thinking of i know one of the future questions is like wh what do you think are some of the um the flaws of character creation i think that's one thing that i i wish that was incorporated more like we kind of worked it out a little bit but mm -hmm. with with some of the characters but we didn't really Establish like how did we meet? How did we come together? Uh, what mm -hmm. what do, how do our characters relate to one another? Um, yeah, I wish like obviously you can do that, but it's not inherent in the system. And I right. wish I wish that it had uh, a stronger kind of relationship mechanic. Yeah, that's true. But I will say that most games that I've played, like you set relationships at the beginning, but then a lot of the time that changes once you get into play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, at least. And yeah. I think one thing that the crew part at least does is gives you a shared purpose. Yeah. That, like, you're all interested in. Yeah. And so, like, kind of like any action movie, you, you get brought together by this purpose, and then you figure out what shakes out once you get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I so can, I think it makes I sense genre-wise. Yeah. I I have always really enjoyed how concise it is. Mm -hmm. I'll still allowing depth like each of the 12 actions is pretty fluid but all of them are useful um i really like how it, how it has you define like a word for your character after its heritage and background mm -hmm. um and like that's not as hard to come up with as you'd expect and it gives a really strong direction for the character mm -hmm. going forward and 
like there's also like we said not a lot of math <laughs> yeah um, i mean we so had to count to four at one point yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you can just say like okay what do i want my character to be bad at competent at good at and then just say zero one or two dots yeah right? and then are you positive or negative with two people it's very uh it's a very binary state game rather than lots of like fiddly plus ones and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a good entry point kind of character building to just be like, okay, I'm going to check this and check this and check this. And I mean, and that's a lot of those powered by the apocalypse bones there. Yeah. That, like having all of that laid out in front of you rather than mm -hmm. having to go digging for it. Um, but yeah, I, I did miss some of the, the relationship type questions and really that's a thing that we sort of come to expect from games that look anything like yeah. the Apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Because when you think about it, very few games really have that built into their creation. It's true. And I think it's just, there was, there's a feeling of like, oh, where is it? Because so much of it looks like that, that like that's the next logical step. But mm -hmm. it's really not a thing that very many games do at all. So it's not like you have to have it in it or it's a bad yeah. game. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like this game uh, lends itself to being capable of creating all of your individual characters on your own time, too, mm -hmm. and then bringing them to the table and saying, okay, let's let's fit these together. Let's create our crew now uh, together. That's uh, pretty much what we did with the Magpies. Everybody kind of built their characters. Like, we talked about what people were thinking of a little bit, but everybody's but I think those mostly like crew balance. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Like not mm -hmm. picking the same playbook purposes, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, everybody kind of built their characters individually. And then for yeah. our session zero, we came together and built the crew. I still remember just like messaging you, messaging you on discord, like while walking out from lunch with my roommate, like I just figured out that thing is going to like change <laughs> thing, change Myra's whole backstory. <laughs> That's such a, like, I love that light bulb moment where you're like, I know who they are. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, it's the <laughs> best. That feels so good. It's the best. My, my first, honestly, one of the first things I knew about Myra was that she had some kind of secret. I just didn't know what the secret was. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And it doesn't come up a lot. It's. But I it, don't think it's been expressly spelled out in the show ever. I think no, it's no, been no, no. hinted it, that at. That definitely hasn't been revealed. It's and, been and it rarely yeah. comes up even, like, as hints, but, like, it's just, like, a thing that was important to me to have, like, underneath everything. So oh, cool. don't worry. It won't be a secret forever. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I take that move, I know when you'll lie about it. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I didn't even consider oh, no. that possibility. Double oh. down. That's amazing. <laughs> He's an evil, evil, wonderful GM, and just, like... Loves to bring out those drama points. <laughs> yeah, she has that like look in her eyes. <laughs> it's that it's GM beautiful. look of like, Ooh. Uh -huh. she just likes to say ominous things and walk away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the role of a GM. Yeah, it? I mean, to like that's be, like cryptic and then just like. <laughs> that's slowly, honestly slowly slide out of the picture yeah it's half the fun of gming is is instilling fear in people and then not following through <laughs> because you're actually a big softy who wants the players to win. Yeah. Yep. I mean, <laughs> not so much the softy part, but uh, that's that's that is I, I I try to be very like threatening and scary and then I'm like, oh no, I can't be mean to them because then they won't win and I want oh. them to win. Uh. <laughs> the thing is you propose drama and we're like, yes, yeah. give it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Put our trash children through the ringer. Yep. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Oh, man, that could be a secondary subtitle for Magpies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right after Be Gay, Do Crime. Yes. <laughs> and awesome. what's the what's Devil's Bargain look like? <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> so many t-shirt options. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how do we think the, the mechanics of character creation reinforce the feel that Blades in the Dark is going for? Man. That's a that's a question. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. I mean, the answer could also be they don't. I think that particularly with the crew building, it's a good way of kind of ex of of showing to players that they are the ones kind of taking the lead on this because part of the crew 
Um, and also kind of part of character creation based on the abilities that you take and the actions that you focus on is telling your GM what kind of story you want. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Because like picking the crew is like, we picked a cult. So the GM for this game would be like, okay, they want a lot of spooky supernatural stuff that's going to deal with ghosts and demons and other cults and probably other forgotten gods. Um, Whereas if we had picked the hawkers who are selling... Uh, some kind of vice, that's a much more like socially oriented group. So that's like, okay, they want to go to like fancy parties and Mm -hmm. uh, have a lot of, uh, you know, probably a lot of really strong NPC relationships with people. So it's, and that is, you know, the, the GM, again, outside of convention play where usually you're just like, this is the crew that you're going to do. Um, the players are telling the GM, this is the kind of game we want to play. These are the kind of crimes that we want to do. Please present us with those opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that I noticed right away when looking at the character sheets to try to figure out um, what type of game this will inform me that I'm going to be playing. Um, one of the things that stood out really right away was the vice mm-hmm. to show mm-hmm. that your character's a not perfect, <laughs> and they they like a little something uh, that they want to get as much of as they can get of, and that 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 to me that feels like a very uh, heisty uh, sort of thing, you know. Yeah, and there's no like virtue or positive aspect <laughs> to like yeah. contrast it or anything. So yeah. it's like there's your baseline, and then this pit of vice that you can slide into. Mm-hmm. I will say that from what you've told me about playing the game and what I know of it, um, I think that the fact that the character creation is so quick and is just kind of like checking things off means that you're not spending a lot of time agonizing over which traits and which feats and which equipment and which exact things, which seems to be a theme of this game of Mm -hmm. kind of just like moving things along. Yeah. And so it seems to sort of reinforce that feel of like, I don't need to have every teeny tiny detail figured out right this minute. Yeah. Like I'll figure out what all of this means and how to flavor it and what it looks like as we go along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to say... The character creation kind of gives you, like, two things that tie into the theme of the game, and one of them is, like, you're a very competent person, here's the ways that you're competent, and, like, here's your specific niche, Mm -hmm. um, which is the playbook, obviously, but also I think it just really grounds you in a world where, and this plays out more in the long game than in the scores, but you have all of these, like, relationships that are pulling you in various directions, Mm -hmm. And that are challenging you. And I think the Clever Friends thing does that. To some extent, the Vice does that. Um, mm-hmm. Where the struggle with yourself. Um, and I, and even just, like, deciding where you come from and, and what you were doing gives you instant, like, points where you could have tension with the world around you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're instantly grounded in the setting, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and Those are almost more important choices than, like, where you put your dots like yeah yeah your heritage is like a super important thing even though it changes nothing mechanically right yeah but it really forces you to think of like what is your place in this society and like the social conflicts are such a big part of blades that i think it's really important that it does that Mm -hmm. yeah I also think that, like, the special abilities and stuff that are in there are really evocative. They're like, really just are. even, yeah. like, the way that they're described gives you a pretty clear picture of, like, what this world is, too. Yeah, like, yeah. E- honestly, everything that you choose is weirdly evocative. Like, even, like, the your clever friends, like, the names. <laughs> Apothecary, yeah. Psychonaut, Corpse Thief, Blood Dealer, and Priestess. Those are my options. Yeah. And that's just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we looked at this, but um, every... Every sheet also gets little special items that are just theirs, too, which is fun. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't really talk about equipment much because equipment doesn't really apply in character creation. But um, it's fun to, like, I'm just looking at mine and I didn't realize you, you get some bandoliers you can throw at people. Um, um, <laughs> potions, basically, if yeah. you're a leech. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, th- and it does also kind of imply some stuff about the character. Like, I think yeah. the... I think the spider, like one of their class items, is a fine bottle of whiskey. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
And I love the sword cane that the slide gets. Yeah. That one's really fun, yeah, too. I, I got a lot of use of that. Yeah, no, that and it, it almost, like, really makes you think of a character like Minx. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know. I think some of the way that it like that blades in general, like everything about blades, really just like gets you. I don't. Know, it's re- especially inspiring to me somehow. Like the way that it just drops evocative things and leaves you to fill in the rest is like probably probably what makes it my favorite roleplay setting. Just because it really just fires my brain up. Yeah. <laughs> so. How do you feel like we kind of answered this a little bit already, but do you feel like the process of character creation sets your expectations for playing this game? Uh, one disconnect that I kind of had going in when I was first learning the system is rolling more die and taking the higher is like less intuitive than rolling die and adding a number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you can look at a big number and be like, oh, I get an idea of how much better this number is. It's a it's a little hard to grok the whole dot thing, especially since like it's increasing your odds of getting a certain number, mm-hmm. I guess. But I will I would say it does a good job of establishing that you are competent at what you do, but this world is rough at the same time. Like a lot of really gritty systems are like oh, you're also just bad at the things your class is supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but this strikes a balance, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point, though. I feel like in a lot of sort of dystopian games that I've played, it's just sort of assumed that you're garbage at everything that you try and do. Mm-hmm. Like, you look at, like, even, like, um, like, Warhammer and stuff, like, you're just not mm-hmm. good at stuff. I think Blades is going for the opposite, though. Like, it's going for the idea that if you really want it, if you're desperate enough, you yeah, could you can be get better it. at it. Yeah. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I think there's even, like, he outlines, like, that everyone can take stress to to be better at things, like... Well, even to do things that you are unskilled in. So, like, like you were saying, yeah. like, there's games where it's like, oh, you're, you, you know, you don't have any ranks in this, you just can't do it. With blades, if you don't have ranks in something, you can either just roll, rolling zero dice is you roll 2d6 and take the lower result, but you can push yourself or take a devil's bargain to get one die. You get a friend to help you. They take a little stress and give you another die. If you are willing to to take some risks yourself and get help from a friend, you can do anything. (laughs) <laughs> or you can yeah. at least have a chance of doing anything. Yeah. But at the same time, the cost of that is literally called stress yeah. <laughs> and trauma. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it's not without cost, yeah. and this world is mm-hmm. rough. Yeah. And you do need to be pretty desperate yeah. to it's yeah. It's very much a, a live fast, die young approach to, <laughs> to character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do think that the dice pool didn't throw me so much, because I... I want to say that when I came into Blades, it was, if I wasn't in the Vampire the Requiem game, I was freshly off it. Um, And so we had dice pools there, too. Like, I think it's just, Mm -hmm. it's different, but, like, not unheard of to do dice pools like that. (laughs) Yeah, I guess I don't know if I've ever played a game that doesn't have dice pools. Well, I mean, building dice pools instead of 2d6 plus Yeah, I mean, and I guess, so I guess at a con I've played masks and some other pbta stuff but like my other games were shadow run <laughs> pools l5r which has dice pools um mm-hmm. and then i have played genesis which has dice pools yeah. yeah and like everything i've played has been like spire also uses dice pools like i maybe i have a thing i think the, I guess. <laughs> the pbta expectation throws you a little bit because it does feel so pbta but then you're doing these dice pools and some other things that are different mm-hmm. but i think once you get used to it it's fine yeah. Yeah, I think once you get over that, like, initial assumption of, like, oh, it yeah. looks like this, so it must be that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still sit down to sessions, and if I'm not thinking, I'll be like, 2D6. Wait, no, not 2D6. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like I said at the beginning of this mm-hmm. uh, discussion. Well, we already went over how the lack of built-in relationships was a fairly big flaw of the system. Mm-hmm. But are there any other flaws that you think this 
character creation has for Blades in the Dark? Or anything that you think that the the character creation could do a little bit better? I don't know. I feel like I feel like some of the crew stuff was like a little bit less resonant to me. I I can't really articulate why I think that. Uh but it but aside from like the name and like what kind of crew you are, everything on it feels a little more complicated and a little less resonant to me, I guess. I I will say that one thing, and this I've noticed in talking with other people who run Blades, the the hunting grounds concept tends to get dropped almost immediately. Very few people, because it does have like, the whole idea of the hunting grounds with the crew is that you get some mechanical bonuses if you do a score in your hunting grounds. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. But like, it requires you to, to stick to a narrow area, and that's not... Most people that are playing the game don't want to do that. You want to get out in this big, cool city. Yeah, so, like, and it also kind of forces the GM to provide scores that are in that hunting ground area. So it tends not to get used very much. I will also say, and this is more just from my experience, and this might just be how the magpies have have shaken out, but... Um, so during crew creation, we kind of had those factions that we identified as having it's potential so relationships. Many, and they don't all get worked in. Yeah, yeah. We, I think the only one that for the magpies that we've kind of continued to in or involve is the Lamp Blacks, who they had kind of a rivalry with. And the only reason that they've really I remained didn't even as prominent. We had them. <laughs> from the beginning <laughs> yeah is is because minx also has a relationship with the leader of that gang um you know i i incorporated one of their other gangs that they had a relationship with i don't think you guys have ever had anything mm-hmm. to do with the gray cloaks who you stole a bunch yeah, of no. furniture from Ooh. they're just a joke <laughs> So I, I feel like, and that may just be kind of how the narrative for the magpies shook out, but, you know, I, I think it's sort of as, this is, you know, maybe more of a, a GM tip, but it's sort of like when you're picking those factions that the crew has a relationship with, make sure that it's ones that are going to have some strong narrative potential mm-hmm. going forward. I feel like that's really hard to know before you right. get into a game, though. Exactly. Like, you don't know what... <laughs> I mean, you can kind of get an idea of, like, what your players are interested in based on, like, some of the choices that they make. But you don't necessarily know, like, where they're going to go with anything. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Honestly, the problem that I have with all, setting up all those factions at the beginning is the same problem that I have with relationships in other PBTA games. It's that... You set this up, but you don't know if it's actually going to be able to pan out the way you want it to, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, it's it's a jumping off point, but not going to be set in stone. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It seems like uh, in most PBTA games, it's a, this is something that happened in the past, and this is how you were linked, and then once you start, anything can go. Um so that that makes sense. And I know a lot of people will lean heavily into those past relationships uh, when they play, especially in a one shot. Uh, and then there's others that will uh, just kind of let them fall to the wayside because they don't really need them because their characters are different from when they were in the past. Yeah. How balanced do you feel like the different character types are do you feel like there's certain playbooks that are significantly better than others or do they kind of balance out pretty well with each other i think they balance out very very well it seems rare that someone is without ability to contribute Mm -hmm. i will say that at least in magpies it does sort of like rotate what kind of jobs each one will shine in Mm -hmm. but everyone shines somewhere Mm -hmm. yeah um like for the slide, not every score is gonna be have like deception and social intrigue be a key element, even if your crew leans that mm-hmm. way. Um so there are just gonna be times where like it's someone else's turn, but everyone gets one. Yeah. That makes sense. At least the GM's good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the fact that there aren't any class skills 
really helps too. So you can kind of, Mm -hmm. if there happen to be gaps in your crew makeup, you can fill them in. So, you know, like if you, if you're playing a game where you don't have a slide, anybody, you could have a really charismatic cutter who is the face (laughs) of the party. Mm -hmm. You could have, yeah, you could have a, a cutter with two points in consort. Mm-hmm. Who is just everybody's friend right until they start punching people? <laughs> um, you you know so there's there's a lot of flexibility and adaptability with the the characters, which I think helps keep things balanced so that yeah people can you know fill different holes in different ways and and all of the skills end up being covered. And then like I said, even if nobody has a certain skill set. Push yourself, get a friend to help, you can give it a shot. Mm-hmm. I will say it feels like two of the playbooks almost feel like they have to open up into like other mechanics that aren't like central. Like the, the whisper gets into like rituals and that doesn't have to come in, but like it feels like you could easily grow out into those mechanics. Um and then the crafting stuff with uh, the leech. The leech. Yeah. Yeah, it it opens up new mechanics, but you can also get by in a game without invoking yeah. those mechanics at all ever. So. Do you feel like there are certain character types that you absolutely need to have? You know, like you think about games that you're like, well, we have to have a healer of some sort, or we're going to be in like serious trouble. <laughs> yeah, you don't I, need a healer. You you can find fine. someone to yeah. patch you up. I feel like <laughs> it's always good to have one or two people who are competent in some sort of combat capacity. Yes. Not necessarily a cutter or hound, but things tend to hit the fan during <laughs> during yeah. a score, so it's nice to have that to fall back on. Yeah, if you're playing Blades, you're going to get shot at. Yeah, and somebody, I think having somebody who's good at talking is also yeah. helpful, mm-hmm. but like I said, any of the playbooks can kind of fill those those roles. Right. So... Yeah, and again, it it also depends on the kind of scores you want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're playing a group of assassins, you may not need somebody who, depending on how you build things out. Like, if you're all really good at stealth, maybe you don't ever need to talk your way into a place. You yeah. maybe just sneak and stab through every mission. <laughs> you know, a lot of it really just depends on the the kind of stuff you want to do. That's very interesting. Yeah, I would advocate for everybody learning to fight at least a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks at my point that I've had to put into skirmish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it skirmish? Yeah. I don't know if it's skir- I think it's hunt. I still don't I don't think I have a point in skirmish. Yeah. You got better at shooting. Mhm. Yeah. Cuz I wanted to stay at the edge of the fight rather than getting in there. Mhm. <laughs> I've been shot too many times. <laughs> How does somebody go about creating NPCs in this game, and how does it different from creating PCs? You don't. Oh. <laughs> oh. And NPCs don't have stats. This is, again, uh, I very rarely roll dice as the GM. Mm-hmm. So NPCs are basically indistinguishable from any other obstacle that a player would face. So uh, a, a guard is the same as a locked door, is the same as a burning building. Mm. Um, It's all just a question of um, what's referred to in the game as tier, um, T-I-E-R. You start as a tier zero crew, and the, the, the kind of rankings go from tier zero to tier five. So... You know, again, like that, that sort of a locked, a tier two locked door is the same level of challenge as a tier two um, gang member as a, you know, they, they sometimes the, you know, you will have a clock for particularly difficult enemies that are going to take a a longer fight to defeat. Mm -hmm. Like if you're fighting a gang boss, like a major named NPC, that's probably somebody who. It's going to take several blows back and forth to defeat them. But that's the same as if you're trying to b- break into the vault of the most secure bank in the city. Getting mm. through that vault door is also going to have a clock and take you a lot of... So yeah, NPCs, you don't, you don't build them out. They don't have any stats. I have a spreadsheet 
that I track my NPCs on that's like name, pronouns, you know, appearance, what voice I do for them, hmm. uh, you know, all kinds of other fun details just sort of to keep track of stuff. But that's that is not anywhere in the book. <laughs> I, that's just kind of my notes so that I can keep track of all of these people that I've populated the city with. Right. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very, it, it makes it so much easier to present uh, human challenges on the fly mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, well, I could have them fight guards, but I don't have the guard stat block ready. So mm -hmm. it's just like, yeah, they're fighting a bunch of guards and they're with the blue coats. So that's like tier three. Uh, it's, Go for it. <laughs> yeah. I like that much better than having to like individually create NPCs. Like even if you have a template, just having to like pull all that information up and yeah. know where it is and everything is still mm -hmm. a lot to deal with. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, you, you don't make NPCs. <laughs> that's the that's the answer. I'm for it. Cool. Yeah. I wanna talk about our group cohesion. Do you think that we gel well? mechanically how do you feel like we would do in a game i think we've i mean a there's five of us which means we cover a lot of diverse things by default mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um from what people were saying um it seems like we've got a pretty good spread of like uh thoughts and actions like everyone's got a little bit of something in each category mm-hmm it did feel like we had a lot of social skills. Yeah. Which, yeah. not a bad thing. It's just we were uh -huh. kind of leaning that direction, but that's not... Mm -hmm. But also, we're hey, a cult. We're... We have to convert people somehow. <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. <laughs> and, like, I really enjoyed how we kind of came together through the process of, um, like, our slide being more involved in getting the, the layer together and Minna's character, like, becoming loyal to mine or bringing in shared connections between our our slide and our whisper and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like I think we have a pretty connected group yeah. going in yeah. here. Yeah, it looks like the only thing that we don't have any dots in is Rec. No, I have Rec. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Good. I came with Rec. Then, <laughs> then we are good on everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I can smash. Have a little chart. It has little oh. dots. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think just you're almost certainly going to have people who are good in a general area and people who are good in multiple areas mm -hmm. is the norm. So you are gonna you can find a way forward. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, let's talk about the system as a whole, though. Um, what do we think about how it plays and how it lends to character development, uh, not necessarily character advancement? Well, if you want to see it in yeah. <laughs> Magpies podcast at Magpies underscore pod. Nice. <laughs> Nicely <laughs> done, Josie. Segway. High uh -huh. five. Uh -huh. That's a good plug. Um, that is one of my favorite things, like pieces of feedback we get from people are like, oh, I found other podcasts through your show. I'm like, yes, do it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it's one thing that I will say that we – that that when I have run this kind of in, in longer campaigns, um, you have to put forth a little extra effort, I feel like, to have um, role play among the characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the interactions are outward facing. It is about how do you interact with NPCs and the challenges of the city. Yeah. And all of your backstory building is... NPC relationships. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you do have to put in a little work. Um, and this was something that we kind of struggled with initially in the Magpies was we didn't always have scenes with the characters interacting much. Um, so it's something where you have to work at a little bit, I think, in, in terms of kind of tying that back to the character development piece um, of, of sort of building those relationships among the characters. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, though... The the whole system, as as Amelia pointed out, is about moving forward of of just this forward motion of things snowballing, mm -hmm. and that is basically the the story of the whole system and of the characters is that you your characters do a score, they make people angry inevitably, <laughs> things go wrong on the score that they have to deal with, and so Suddenly that ties into. 
Yeah, that ties into the next score where more things go wrong and more people are angry at them. And it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. So like four or five sessions in, you've got this horrible web of problems (laughs) that your characters are having to deal with. And I think you figure out who your characters are through like almost by grinding them against these other perspectives in the city. Like uh, we Definitely. didn't know that we were going to become vigilantes until we kept running into these assholes and decided we wanted to fight them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Strong agree though. I think that like that's because failure sort of forces you to think about who you are and how to fix things and like, build some of that momentum for you i think that you know a system that forces you into really difficult situations over and over and over again has a tendency to like i mean it just sort of like polishes your character yeah right? like you're constantly like grinding up against things until it is smooth and or broken the faction game yes <laughs> <laughs> is the other way it can go that's yeah i mean either way I'll yeah go. so so ultimately like kind of long-term character advancement with stress If you ever fill up your stress meter, which is nine points of stress, you take a level of trauma, which is some change to your character's personality. It can be, it's it's things like vicious or cold or soft or something based on whatever happens, it changes your character. You can do that four times, at which point your character is just too traumatized and, and broken down by the life that they have lived, they cannot keep doing it. Mm. Um, And then throughout the game, you have the opportunity to anytime you make money, you can put some aside kind of in a stash and your character's ultimate fate is determined by how much money you've socked away for them. Oh, wow. Um, So it's kind of like, you know, if you have a decent amount of cash, it's like, okay, you can retire into something comfortable. Maybe you open a little business. Or if you haven't put a lot of money away, it's like, you die in a gutter. <laughs> <laughs> so your magpies are not doing great on that front then? It depends. Manx is doing good. Yeah, Manx has a <laughs> lot of money put away. Because I have the slide ability that's yeah. just at the end of every She makes a little money on the get. side. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nice. Other, nice. Other characters? Maybe. Lyra's got... I think maybe two ticks in that second tier. Yeah. So like they have made enough money that like they are they are squirreling some money away for their future, but um, We also made a lot more money in the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Um I will say that also like the faction game and the way it places you into this social web, like you these characters figure out how they want to stand in regards to everyone else around them, and I think that develops them as people. Mm-hmm. Which cuz like Magpies uh becomes very much a <laughs> class warfare thing, a deciding what you think is right and wrong thing. Um, with this group that we've built, I can imagine that we look into ideas about like power and and the right to authority and legacy, things like that. Like Definitely. Those yeah. are all pretty strong themes that I think we've And I think the characters we already see would have different views on this and discover things about each other and and fight and yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so this is our last segment that we go through here we want to talk about character advancement and in this segment we call it take it up a level (laughs) (laughs) take it up a level take it up a level all right in this segment we will cover how character advancement or leveling up is covered in the system so how does a character level up in blades in the dark and what sort of perks are we looking at when that happens? It's not leveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's actually, so the experience system is going to sound a little complicated when I explain it, but it's not actually that difficult. <laughs> so you have four experience tracks. Okay. And I promise it's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you so far. Yep. So you have, um, I, re- I mentioned with the action uh, uh your that action list that it was broken up into three categories resolve prowess and insight um those categories relate to some other mechanics in the game but one of the mechanics is experience each of those categories has a little experience bar and 
you there is also just a general playbook experience track. So you can earn experience in basically two ways. Um, the first is any time that you roll a, a desperate action, um, which basically means the GM tells you you are in a desperate position, you are outnumbered, um, outmatched. Outgunned. <laughs> I was trying, I realized I was leading into that, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Thank you for understanding, because that was the only word I can remember of no. that lyric. No, my, my, I got it. my brain was going to Hamilton. I tried to, I veered my speech away from it, but. But but basically, yeah, you're, yeah. you're at that point, and you got to yeah. use all of your, all of your everything, and you gain an experience point in the track that that action is underneath. Yeah, so like uh, skirmish is in the the prowess category. So if I rolled a desperate skirmish action, no matter what happens, it doesn't matter if you succeed or you fail, just by trying something that is so far above what you're capable of, you get experience. So that's one. The other way that you get experience is at the end of the session, if you look at your character sheet, there is... Uh, a set of questions that you kind of answer about your character. Or, or not questions, but sort of like, did you do this thing? So each playbook has a, a sort of playbook relevant question. So like for the lurk, it's you addressed a challenge with stealth or evasion. If I did that one time in the session, I get one point of XP. If I did it two or more times, I get two points of XP. And those I can put in any... Uh, any track that I want. Okay. I can put them in my playbook. I can put them into one of those categories. Um, similarly, um, it's the same thing with XP distribution for the other uh, questions. You expressed your beliefs, drives, heritage, or background. You struggled with issues from your vice or traumas. So mm -hmm. basically, um, you and it's up to the player. The player decides uh, if they earn XP for those things. So you just kind of go through, did I do these things? Yes or no. Did I do it more than once? And then you, you award yourself XP and, and distribute it wherever you want. Mm. Um, when you fill up one of those, one of the action categories, uh, resolve, insight, or prowess, you can put uh, another dot into one of your, your actions in that category. So like if I filled up prowess, I could put another dot into one of the actions under prowess. When you fill up your playbook, you get to take another special ability. So yeah, there's not really a straightforward, like I have gained enough XP and now I have unlocked new stuff. It's just sort of like, eh, I'm gonna, you know, you it, it's, it's a little more wishy-washy. And so you can choose of like, you know, if you are realizing like, oh, okay, we keep running into situations where it would be really helpful if somebody was better at tinkering. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put all my XP that I can towards that so that I can get uh, a dot in tinker. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so that is the, the perks that you get are, are more dice or a special ability, basically, mm -hmm. when you get enough experience. I just realized or remembered, I guess, because I always forget, like... I didn't bring it up before, but the XP triggers, uh, that list of questions, just almost entirely keyed off of playing the character you created, which is really, really encourages role -playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, mm -hmm. you don't get XP if you're not playing your character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the second one is almost entirely yeah. the you expressed your beliefs, drives, heritage, or background. That's entirely a roleplay question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not getting into scenes where your character is expressing who they are then yeah good luck yeah yeah <laughs> so um and incidentally the the crew oh you're right i forgot yeah. i completely forgot yeah the crew also gets xp um the crew does not have a desperate action equivalent but uh it does have some questions oh i see um yeah that are, are similar sort of things of like there's one that is specific to the crew type and then some ones that are just kind of relevant that, that, that all of them deal with. But yeah, it's like, yeah. The Advance the agenda of your deity or embody its precepts in action. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, <that's> good. <laughs> and then when, when the crew, when the crew XP track fills, you have a couple options. You can either get two more crew upgrades, which are that, that list that we looked at earlier, 
one special ability or one cohort, um, which is either like another gang of people to do your bidding or a single NPC expert mm. also to do your bidding. Nice. So. Crew also can gain turf, but that's more of a thing you get through scores. Yeah. Yeah, that's not an XP thing. So it sounds like we've kind of answered my next question, too, mm-hmm. but would it be beneficial to have that advancement in mind during character creation? It seems like the answer is generally no. Yeah, yeah, because you can kind of fill stuff in as you see needs. Mm-hmm. You don't really have to have a... It's, it, I will s- Sorry. <laughs> oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's not like you, yeah, you don't really have to have a, a plan of like, okay, I have to take this special ability to unlock this special ability. You can just kind of yeah. wing it. But I think you can also, because you can always get that ability later, you can factor that into like when you're creating it, you can think, oh, it'd be more interesting story-wise if I had this advancement later mm-hmm. after going into it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is or kind ultimately, of like, who do I want to start out as? Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. and like this, this can come later as like a a way that my character has changed, and it'll be more dramatic that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, is advancing a skill or or advancing uh, to a new playbook ability or or even leveling up your crew? Does that happen relatively quickly, generally, or is that like a multi session sort of thing before? Multi-session. Yeah. yeah. I was say, it seems yeah. like a slower... But not, uh, not a ton of sessions. I would say that yeah. somebody fills an XP track usually every two or three sessions. Yeah. Okay. It depends on how much you're concentrating on one XP track, because I will bounce between them because I've decided my priority is different this session for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm very bad and at I tend to, like, those. focus fire. Yeah. Yeah, I know. My next advancement down. Yeah, Josie, you were like early on, you were rapid fire getting new special abilities. Um, <laughs> and I think it's just you were dumping everything into playbooks so you could unlock those. Yep. So I'm starting to like highlight which things I want next just <laughs> so I can give myself a focus because I never remember. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, like the choice like lets you choose between like linear and lateral advancement mm-hmm. as you need. So I like focus fired getting more options first before getting like linearly better at things. Yeah. yeah. But even then putting that first dot into an ability or an action essentially does open up an option for you because now you can do that ability without taking stress right. and stuff. So Yeah. But sometimes that doesn't feel as good. Yeah. <laughs> Although it will feel better next time you're rolling resistance for that section. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think that pretty much wraps everything up. We did it. Okay. We did it. <laughs> well, oh we made gosh. people. We, made we people. did. We made some trash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we made a gang for or a, a cult full of spoiled rich kids uh-huh. who yes. want more power. Oh, yes. Oh, God. Guys, it's the proto circle of flame. <laughs> This is an yeah. early version. Oh, oh no! God. The Circle of yeah, Flame blood is another sacrifice and everything. The Circle uh. of Flame is another gang in the the Blades book that oh. has tr- has emerged as the main antagonist <laughs> in the Magpies, <laughs> and they they are a bunch of spoiled rich people who are desperately trying to amass more power. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> also very occult. Also very into human sacrifice. Just, yeah. I mean, you've only found them doing it in one place. Like, you don't know. Not we the found them doing you don't it know in one their place. lives. <laughs> also, there's know. a whole other. You're not the boss of them. Okay, we found them doing one human sacrifice and planning to do another type. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you need to try things more than once to be sure. Exactly. Uh-huh. They were doing a little experimentation. <laughs> anyway, That's just if one science. doesn't work, you're not using enough. Mm-hmm. Of it. They really were doing science. It was Amazing. some bad science, but it was <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, this has been this yeah. has been awesome. I think yes. my voice is gone. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of fun. Though. It yes. was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Learning about Blades in the Dark was definitely a joy. And creating these amazing and horrible people. <laughs> They're terrible. <laughs> was I amazing. love them. It's good. Yes. Uh, Blades is so good at creating just that, that wonderful character who's like morally 
ambiguous at best, but you just love this trash uh-huh. fire. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Can we go ahead and remind everyone where they can yes. find you and what sort of things you're working on now? Let's start with Re, please. All right. So I'm Re. I am uh, still the GM and producer of the Magpies podcast, which you can find me at Rhiannon42 on Twitter. That's my personal account. You can find the Magpies at Magpies underscore pod on Twitter at MagpiesPodcast.net for our main website and Patreon.com slash Magpies Podcast uh, if you want to throw some money our way and get some cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm Josie. I play Minx on the Magpies Podcast and you can find my art and streams on my Twitter at Dragon Girl Josie. And I am Minna. I play Myra on the Magpies podcast and Inez on the Iron Hides podcast. And you can find me at Mina Minar. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. This was so much fun. Yeah. I'm glad that we got to do so this. This is a game blast. I've been super interested in for a while. Mm-hmm. So Some, we- someday when my schedule when our schedules align, I will run a game with the two of you. I've got such a long list ah. of people who are <laughs> like, oh, I, re- I love hearing about Blades. I want to play it so much. I'm like, I'm just going to like start a waiting list <laughs> yeah, <get laughs> and just GM games. I'm not a great GM, but I'm willing to help with the mission of like, people getting to play this game. <laughs> Everyone needs to play this game. I have mm-hmm. definitely run one shot solely for that reason. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us and thank you to everybody else for tuning in. We will be back next week. Bye. 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 Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the product can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. teeny Chessex dice, so you get 36 in a container of those. And, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. It's too many. <laughs> I I love those, and I got my son some, except that I keep finding them, like, in his bed when I'm changing the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. Honestly, like, on the floor I keep of finding my them in my bed. <laughs> <laughs> they get everywhere. I don't. I still don't know where one of them is. I know there's one specific one missing, and I can't find it. It's gone forever. It's like socks in the that, dryer. It sounds like a Pixar film. <laughs> It's off having a magical adventure. Mm-hmm. I know what you're thinking of, Minna. I know. Yeah. Horrible moose hands. Oh, my God. <laughs> Skittles. We had, in, in a, a one-shot game that I ran for a charity stream, we had uh, a good friend of ours, Waffles, um, played a hound whose hunting pet was a moose with horrible, long, spindly arms. And at the end of those spindly arms were not hooves, but hands. Oh, no. Horrible <laughs> moose hands. <laughs> At one point, it picked us up with its horrible moose hands. Also, it, like, w- runs along the ground like a spider. <laughs> it's bad. As, as, the, 
as the GM, I was obligated to describe the sounds that the horrible moose hands made as was they slapped against the cobblestones. Yes. Oh god, so, it was that very, is the worst. It was. It was this great. Is a night themed around terrible noises. <laughs> you hear clapping as you. Oh. Sit. <laughs> um, I love Skittles. <laughs> animals so, with hands are no good. I'm just no, gonna put that out there. Somebody doing the Monty, Monty Python coconuts just with their hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have? A hound, leech, lurk, whisper, and a slide. Oh, slide. Yeah. Yes. I'm the slide. Wee. Ah, uh, yeah. Gosh, it's a good thing Minx does not have. That I am ability. waiting <laughs> for the day that you take it. <laughs> Josie, <laughs> Josie, I have so many plans. <laughs> okay. Now I know what to put my XP towards. <laughs> Weird. Would you smooch a ghost? Oh, Heck yes. Yeah. No. If that's your kink and you get possessed in the midst of a, of a score, what happens? You have fun with you it. You definitely get XP. Really great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yep, this is a family friendly show. <laughs> <laughs> We're fine with pushing the borders a little bit with the content. Um, so we'll just say hmm. they have a little bit You're of fun. only fine with like a little bit. I'm fine with whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I hate naming people. Mm -hmm. It's the worst. Uh -huh. I had to name actual humans too. It was awful. Oh. I can't even imagine. Like I get so stressed out about naming like NPCs who will literally never show up again. I cannot imagine naming an actual human. Have I told you the story of how I named Nathan? Yeah, yeah. It's oh, amazing. Man. It's because I'm indecisive, so I just make other people make that choice for me. Oh, my God. <laughs> what did you do? Okay, so um, we did like an NCAA-style bracket where we picked 32 <laughs> girls' names and 32 boys' names. My ex-husband and I each picked six, 16 of each, and then we put them in a bracket. And That's then amazing. every day... I would post on Facebook like a survey and have people vote on them. Oh and then we like slowly narrowed it down <laughs> until we had um, Mora and Nathan were the girl's name and boy name. And then I had a boy. So he is Nathan. Hmm. Yep. Decided via internet. Yep. So it was like all of my family <laughs> and friends and my ex's family and friends. And like I had a couple college professors <laughs> who like voted in there every day. It was good. It was good. I, I don't remember how I... I I don't remember how it came up, but I actually told that story at work to one of my friends who had a baby last year. And she was like, oh, my God, that's the best thing ever. If I have it's another so kid, good. I'm doing it. It's so good. And it was like it, people because there were so many people voting every day was like 35 or 40 people, I think. Um, it They weed out like the weird names. It's not like they pick, you know, anything bizarre. Like there are a couple names in there that were just like. Uh, I need four more names because I'm at twelve <laughs> instead of sixteen. You know, but depends on who you pose it to. I feel like if you post it to the Nameberry community, mm. oh yeah, I have somewhere. There's like a, I have like a tweet that I had decided on the name for my second child based on names I'd seen on like these mom blogs, and I was like, my future child is now race car Aragorn. <laughs> <laughs> So I just like that is my future non-existent child oh. is like whenever I have to talk about Great like God. yeah when I become a super rich suburban stay-at-home soccer mom you could call them RC of, for short yeah my sweet my sweet sweet oh. child race car Aragorn <laughs> good old RC <laughs> yeah. uh, um <laughs> God damn it I keep forgetting no swears wow. yeah I swear I swore <laughs> I'm sorry. Just I have a note out. card on my desk that says no, <laughs> no swears. swears. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very bad about this. It's it's really difficult. I've gotten better at mm -hmm. it, but like, man. It's just that uh, my gamey persona doesn't have to filter herself very yeah. much. Like, I, I'll say stuff like, gosh darn it, at work. All the time. <laughs> automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, I have audio of, like, at one point, my internet cut out, and then Ryan was, like, we were both still recording, and it's just him being like... Gosh darn it! <sighs> oh, fiddle and, like, it's just like the most the most wholesome thing I've ever heard. It's just like, oh man, like, what a bummer! Like, oh Ryan, bless you. Um, no 
we got to read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit One Shot Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep, keep going. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Backstory. Backstory is a cozy, thoughtful interview show featuring the most fascinating folks in role-playing. Join host Alex Roberts as she gets to know game designers, LARP rights, scholars, community organizers, and more. From emerging artists to seasoned veterans, guests open up about their creative process, what keeps them engaged, and their visions for the future of role-playing.